Uh, welcome back. Having seen the different procedural constructs and uh, different loop equations and the tasks and functions, the difference between tasks and functions in Verilog and system Verilog, we now uh, will look at uh, how to pass arguments in a routine like task and function. And we have seen how the arguments are getting the value by default. And we will now see for the next type, which is going to be uh, passing the values to the arguments with <coughs> uh, names. So, here is an example. Uh, as you see, uh, you are uh, allowing the arguments in the task and functions to be declared as ports. And uh, it is something similar as in a model. And if there are some task and functions with many arguments and some of them with default values, it is required to set them uh, with new arguments or say subset can be a part of the arguments or a subset of arguments are given a new value and that can be done by <coughs> specifying the name of the routine argument with a port like syntax as in the example. So, here is an example of a task by name many and it has input of integer type of uh, different uh, variables are a, b, c, d and they have been given the values in the function uh, task declaration itself as 1, 2, 3, 4 respectively. What I am doing in the task is something very simple, displaying the values of A, B, C, D. Now, the thing is that I can pass <coughs> the arguments by name. So, here you can see and that has been written in a different block of code in an initial block. And I have a reference to the same task with different arguments as you see. So, I am calling the task man many with the argument 6, 7, 8, 9. So, it means I am specifying all the names, okay, uh, all values for A, B, C, D, not only 1, 2, 3, 4. And then if it is to be using uh, default values, then I will specify without any arguments, just call that task with an empty uh, braces. Or else, if I want to change one of the variable or one of the argument, okay, by value of say 5, here it is an instance of calling the task many and uh, referring to C as the name and the value is going to be 5, okay. In that case, it displays <coughs> A, B, D as the original default values, but C will be taking the value 5. And or else I can do with the position as well, okay. So, as you see A place has been left vac vacant, it means that it will take the default value. B has been specified to be 6, C is again the default value but a D has been assigned with 8 and here I am doing both that is passing the arguments by position as well as by name. So, by position it is for B and by name it is going to be for D. So, as you see the displayed values for A, B, C, D are going to be now according to this A is 1 which is default b is 6 as mentioned in the value and c is going to be default which is 3 and d is going to be 8 which is actually passed with the value. So, this example is actually showing almost all types of passing the arguments by value, by name, by position everything and you can also uh, mix the different ways of passing the arguments. So, after doing certain task 
uh, inner task or a function or a executing some of the statements, how do we return from a routine that is which can be a task or a, a return, uh, function. So, you have <coughs> one example showing how to return in a task and how to return an array from a function. So, as you see here, uh, you have declared a task which is going to be load underscore array with certain inputs and uh, the value of other uh, elements have been taken by reference and declared as automatic. And if the length is less than 0, which is one of the input variable, display bad length and then you are returning. So, as you see, the return is going to be very simple and uh, it is going to be uh, based on certain condition and you display the message and return. And you can write rest of the task code in the next state. And uh, this is only in a case when you, this condition becomes true. And in case of a function, here also uh, there is a transmit uh, function which is uh, of the type bit and you have an input variable data which is also of bit type 32 bit wide and then uh, the type is going to be input. And here what you are uh, doing is you are returning the status that is based on certain transaction uh, that has been done in the function. You are returning the status and the return status is going to be 0 if there is going to be an error. So, this is how uh, in a function the return is going to be done with respect to an array and here is how you are going to return from a task based on a condition. All these are possible. <coughs> Now, there is one more way of returning from a function or a task okay, in system Verilog. Uh, this is with, a, uh, with or without computation and uh, this can be done in two different ways as uh, has been shown. So, returning an array from uh, a function in a function with the type def keyword and passing an array to a function as a ref argument. So, here are the two things that you are going to see. Notice that <coughs> there is a function fixed array okay, which is 5 underscore t and uh, it is being declared in it and uh, with the input of integer type start. And then for each of the elements in the init, okay, you are going to add that element with the start, whatever the value that has been provided and uh, init i is going to be updated. And in uh, initial phi, uh, another set of uh, concurrent block, you have f i being taken from the fifth array element of init and for each of f of 5 you need to display. So, this will display up to the fifth element in case of this particular execution. <coughs> but here what you have done is uh, the fixed array what we have saying here has been already declared as an array with 5 elements with the keyword type def. So, it is going to display up to 5 and it will display that particular element and you are declaring once again the fixed array and that is what you are going to pass on to the function and that is how this whole function is going to be run. Now, if there is no type def, you can actually refer to another array and pass an array to a function by the keyword ref and that is an argument by itself. So, notice here that is also here type def is going to be a separate statement outside the function 
and with that we refer to the different values. And now here as you see, there is a reference uh, to int f5, that is we are using the keyword ref and then in input integer uh, type which is start as a variable. For f5, you are doing the same operation what has been done here, the same thing is being done. But here what you are going to see uh, is that since you have passed it by reference, you are reading the fifth element integer 5 and then you are reading the rest of the array f a and 5 and for each of that element you are displaying the variable uh, f a and that is going to be in decimal format and for that every element you are taking the array element from f of f a of i. So, it is almost the same thing that we are doing, but we are doing it with two different ways. That is with type def and ref. Uh, notice that one more thing that you can uh, do here is that when you are passing an array to a function with a ref uh, argument, it can be declared as automatic. Void is going to be something because function is not returning any value as such okay. and automatic will actually make use of local storage, uses the local storage like a stack, stores all the array elements and releases once the function is going to return. But here also it is a function but it is also returning without utilizing the storage. Okay. But the thing is you are declaring the array type and the number of elements with the type def keyword earlier. So, this is one of the difference between I mean you can do the same task, but doing it in different ways. And we will come back to the same thing once again that what we have done so far by use of the keyword automatic, here is the explanation why we should do it. Actually in Verilog, <coughs> all the objects that have been declared in the language are allocated with a static storage. Means that in uh, our routine, the arguments and the local variables are also stored by use of Verilog statements in a fixed location rather than pushing them onto stack as in other programming languages. In system Verilog, we use the static storage once again for routines and this is by default, but we can override that by declaring some of the variables and uh, or the routine, not variables, sorry, the routines as automatic and you can uh, do it by adding the automatic keyword in the program statement or the routine statement, which we have seen in several cases so far. And this is one of the feature that system Verilog offers, okay, but not with the Verilog. So, here it is something like you will be avoiding the use of static storage which for the sum of the routines which are not going to consume any memory as such. Okay. And this is a feature allowed in software programming languages, but can be allowed in hardware programming languages by system Verilog. So, here is a task and it is also declared as a program within a program. Okay. We will look at what is a program in the next uh, topic. So, here we have declared the test of a task. Okay. Uh, here in this case it is a function, test is a function and has been declared as automatic. And the task that has been defined in this program is that wait for the bus and wait for bus with the different arguments like address, expect data and success. 
So, if you are uh, looking for a particular address, say bus underscore address, while that bus underscore address is not equal to the address specified, okay, at any change in the bus address, you will notify the success by assigning uh, a one if bus data equals expected data and that is the end of the task. So, here as you see, it will read 32 bit address, looks into the data in a given address and it will compare with the bus address as well as to the given address and if it is true or false based on whether bus underscore data is equal to expect data, you are notifying what is going to be success. It can be uh, true or false or 1 and 0 based on whether this expression turns out to be true or false. So, this is the end of task, but you see in spite of declaring different inputs and outputs with different bit width etcetera, this has been declared as automatic and hence does not consume any memory and that is one of the best feature offered by system Verilog. So, here is this example which shows the usage of sta uh, automatic storage. And in a task, <coughs> you can do variable in initialization okay? and you can create local variable in this particular example and you can attempt to initialize it to the current value of the address bus. So, as you see here, uh, there is an initialization. Notice that this has not been declared as automatic. And uh, what you are doing is, you are looking at the clock, at pause edge of clock, you are repeating this statement execution 5 times, looking at the condition bus underscore cmd, whether it is equal to read. Okay. If it is true, then local address will be left shifted, uh, is assigned with address with that has been left shifted by 2 bits and this is going to be something uh, bug as you see and uh, because this has been declared as 8 bit and you are shifting by 2 bits and uh, you are doing so without even initializing local address to 0. So, this is going to uh, report a violation on or any, whether it is run as a part of test bench or anything. But this is something that you have to do and notice that this local address has not been initialized. So, whatever you say local address with the local address, this may be erroneous in this particular uh, task. So, as you see it is statically the local address is statically allocated and it is actually initialized at the start of the simulation, but not when begin and end block is going to be entered that is here and here. So, if this program is declared as automatic, then initialization will happen by itself by default arguments taking them a local underscore address as 0 and then rest of the things are going to be happening. Okay? And also the memory will be released after the end of the task. Now, there is an another feature in uh, Verilog as well as system Verilog that is how do we uh, specify time values in test benches. Uh, by default, not by default, I am sorry, uh, in Verilog there is a, I mean, a com I mean a statement which is in the control block of the program, a tick time scale and it allows you to specify the time values uh, both uh, 
with respect to the unit that has been used and the precision with which it is going to be used or it also defines the resolution, uh, time resolution in the given test bench. So, what happens in case of Verilog is that if you are using this tick time scale, it should be defined even in your design as well as in the test bench or any other routine or task where this particular time scale has been defined and it has to be compiled in an order, okay, so that it is going to be set to a different value every time and then it resets it back to a company specific default value such as 1 nanoscale, 1 nanosecond by 1 nanosecond. But <coughs> this is something that we have to take care uh, because the compilation has to happen in an order, otherwise this is going to be something problematic. System Verilog overcomes this. Okay, by allowing new constructs to specify the time values in a given block. And uh, there are time unit and time precision declaration, okay, which actually eliminate this ambiguity by precisely specifying the values for every module. So, you do not have to worry about the order in which the compilation happens. So, as you see, I have an example here which actually uh, shows different uh, ways the time units and the time precision and how the time literals are going to be specified. Okay. So, notice that you can specify time with tick time scale and go back to the very original Verilog version or you can use time unit and time precision. And the code can make even more time aware by using the classic Verilog uh, system commands with dollar time format, dollar time and dollar real time, which are going to use the time format that you are using and also uses the current system time and also the actual real time which is going to be the clock in the system. And there are four different arguments can be given to dollar time format, okay. So, that is minus 9 for nanoseconds and minus 12 for picoseconds and the second one is going to be which is nothing but the scaling factor for time and the number of digits to the right of the decimal point and or a string to print after the time value and the minimum field width. So, here is an example which shows how to display this time by declaring time units, time precision and using them in a the system command as dollar time format. So, as you see <coughs> We have these four arguments minus 9. So, means that the time unit is going to be uh, in nanoseconds and it is going to be using three digits to the right of the decimal point and the display string is going to be nanosecond because it is in nanosecond and the minimum field width is going to be 8 bits. So, you are actually looking at uh, dollar uh, real time, okay, that is with a display uh, command at the different values of time 1, 2 nanoseconds, 0 0.1 nanosecond and 41 picosecond. So, it will be displaying these values because you are looking at the real time and at one point of time you are going for the real time in a fractional display and hence the time will be displayed as 3.100. Otherwise, the system Verilog also allows if it is going to be say integer and other things, it is going to be allowing 
the time to be rounded off. So that is how even though the real time is 3.100, it is rounded off to 3. And if you want <coughs> exact time, you can go for dollar real time and if the resolution has been changed to 41 picosecond after the elapse of 3 nanoseconds. So, you can see that after 3.1, 41 picoseconds have been added and it displays this value for the dollar real time command. So, this is how a system Verilog allows you to use, uh, allow you to specify time values and also use them with the dollar real time and dollar time uh, command, system command. <coughs> and also the time values can be stored in variables and it can be used in different calculations and delays and this is something that is uh, a, a feature in system Verilog with respect to time. And the values can also be scaled or rounded according to the current time scale and the precision. And the real time variables should be used if this is going to be a problem. So, as you see here in this example, <coughs> I am declaring uh, real, uh, RT delay which is real time and 800 picosecond and you have specified the time uh, scale here as 1 nanosecond that is every time, every time you augment it will be taken in nanosecond representation and the precision is going to be 100 picoseconds. So, RT delay is given the value 800 picosecond and T delay has been given the same value and you are using again 4 arguments time format. So, you are using minus 12, so that means it is going to represent in pico <coughs> seconds and the decimal digits after the uh, point that is going to be 0 and the display string is going to be picosecond corresponding to picosecond and the bit width is going to be 5. So, it cannot be more than that. So, you will be displaying not uh, the RT delay after uh, I mean this is hashtag RT delay means you need to allow 800 picoseconds to pass and execute this statement. So, it will display RT delay as 800 picoseconds. Then hashtag T delay which again allows a delay of T delay which is also 800 picoseconds and dollar display statement is run after that and you are using it to display T delay and uh, just notice here in this case the T delay has been simply declared as time whereas RT delay has been declared as real time. So, re RT delay is read in picoseconds whereas T delay is rounded off to nanoseconds though it is equal to 800 picoseconds and in case of display, it displays 1000 picoseconds which is equivalent to 1 nanosecond, but it is represented in picoseconds because you are using the time format as picoseconds and number of digits are going to be 5. So, and after this, you can reset it to default okay, that is provided by the system. 1 nanosecond by 1 nanosecond with the tick time scale uh, command. And uh, there are 2, 3 things that you should notice uh, with respect to dollar time and dollar real time that is where to use what <coughs> okay? and when it is convenient to use dollar time and when it is convenient to use real time. Notice that if you want an integer representation for the time, then use dollar time okay? and it will be scaled to the time unit of the current module which has been declared with tick time scale. Okay? But it will miss 
any fractional uh, units, if at all, it is going to be there. Whereas a dollar real time returns a real number with the complete time value even with fractions. So it is more appropriate because when you are running the test benches, you need to know the time width for which the variable is going to be there in one value and when it is going to change if it is to be noticed, it is good to use dollar real time because it returns a real number with the fractional increments in time and that is going to be more appropriate to analyze a design. So with this, I hereby conclude my presentation on the different procedural constructs and the task and function features. And uh, it uh, helps you now to write the test benches in a more precise and concise manner. Okay? And I have presented uh, how to use them with different examples. <coughs> and also we have looked into the different timing controls construct and as well as thread control and also how to mix up the four state logic with examples. So, and I have these examples being run in uh, system very long language, okay, and with the compiler chosen from, you can run any of the code that has been displayed here with any of the simulator and uh, the most flexible way to do this is to use the EDA playground tool which has been offered by uh, Dulos. And uh, I have some of the examples here. So I'll be showing some of the examples which I showed in the code here. Uh, for example, how to use the dollar time and dollar real time and how to represent them in a proper display statements. I'll show them here now. So here is my uh, playground from EDA playground. I have uh, taken some of the modules and have run them and I will show you for uh, better understanding of what I have explained so far. So here is an, I will come to the time representation. So here is an example. Where the display time is being shown. Uh, this runs with the network speed. So as you see, uh, I have the code here uh, for a particular task and uh, it is actually uh, displaying an uh, array and the address and the task takes those arguments here. Notice that I haven't used any of the ref or constant or automatic or anything. And I am decrementing the address and uh, printing the address, okay, and uh, displaying in a function uh, which has been declared as automatic void and it uh, prints the value and the printing is going to be the simulation time with the dollar time variable. Notice that it is going to be integer. <coughs> And I run this code for uh, 2000 uh, time units. So I will run this. Let me check. So here is an option uh, where I can choose different uh, tools. Uh, you can choose MentorQuesta, Synopsys, or uh, Aldec Riviera, or you can also choose Cadence Exilium. I will choose Mentor Questa and uh, I will not open with the file, but instead I will see the simulation in a waveform format. And you can also sc see the screen here in this uh, part of the screen, the result, where you can see the results as of running as well as the results which are required as per the module. So I will run this. Oh, 
Okay. So this is the EP wave where the results are shown in the waveform format. Only single slice of data is formed, not an issue. So you see that this displays the address as whatever the value that has been taken uh, in eight, uh, nine bits, you can choose, change it to binary representation and the address is being uh, shown. And this has been asked in a, a task. Now I will close this and see the result where I have asked a print statement here where I will be displaying the simulation time and the value which are passed from the current time and the value that is uh, looking at the integer value here. And uh, since it is a function have been declared as automatic and void, the initialization happens with 0. So as you see, the simulation after run is being shown as exactly like this, simulation time colon value is 0 and uh, dollar time is 0 and value is 0. So this is how it has been done and it has done uh, no iterations and you have run the top instance and this is what is the result of the run. Okay. So you can see how a function has been run and how the address has been decremented and displayed in the EP wave. And it is the use of both task and function has been given in this particular example. <coughs> so here is an another example where you have a task, a routine which actually calculates the sum with input arguments A and B and uh, a result is going to be C declared as output and uh, the variables have been declared as int type and I have assigned C to be equal to A plus B and I am calling this particular task okay, as sum 10, 5 and X, X is going to be my uh, result. And I am running a display command which is going to be uh, displaying the value of x in a statement and the decimal value is going to be taken and the argument is taken from the variable x. So as you see, this is passing the arguments by position. So a will be read as 10, b is read as 5 and c is going to be x. So without me wasting much of the time. I will run this. As you know, 10 plus 5 is going to be 15 and the value is going to, value of x is going to be 50. And here, same mentor questa is being taken. If you want, we can run it with synopsis. I will run once again. Save because the choice of the tool has to be saved. I will run it once again. Okay. Now you see the same result has been shown, value of x is 15 and this is uh, VCS simulation and notice that the tool has been different in two different runs but the result is same. And this is exactly the same thing that I told you in the beginning of my uh, topic that the constructs that I have been provided in the procedural constructs or statements or new features, they will work irrespective of the tool. Okay, I will go back to one more example.
So, is, is this is also the sum, I think this is what I displayed just now. Okay. So, notice here the same task that has been done to find the sum of two integer numbers uh, is being done with a function and here in function is sum and uh, it takes two inputs a and b and returns the value a plus b and I have done uh, a display statement calling function with void and the void uh, call is going to display the sum uh, result of calling the function sum with 10 and 5 as arguments. Again, no EP wave. Uh, I can make an another choice for the tool. This time it is cadence exilium. I will save this run again. So, you see the result has been displayed as since it should not return any value irrespective of what is being done in the function, see that it is now displaying calling function with void. That is what I have given as the display statement here and uh, that is being displayed here after the run. Notice that this time I have taken the tool cadence exilium which is a simulation tool and it will exit after displaying and because it is a void statement the next statement is going to be void and the return is going to be not there. <coughs> okay, now I will show you another. This is a complete set of uh, modules where you can uh, run the task and function with the different options that have been uh, presented in earlier. <coughs> okay, now I have the same function to calculate the sum of two integers a and b and uh, it will display now with x value and it actually using this function with the arguments 10 and 5 and I am adding it to 10, just observe what is going to happen and it will display the value of x as whatever has been calculated in the initial block. I will not show any output file, go for the default mentor questa which has been saved, no waveform representation as well, I will run the code. So, you see now this time since x has been uh, declared in the initial block, it will take the value of uh, the sum function on 10 and 5, add it to 10 and then shows the result and x is now going to be 25. So, here is something that you can do extra. Uh, with function as well as separate statements, okay. So, this is one such example. Yes, I think that is enough. We can check some of the loops. Let me check if it is there. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.